Hi, it's Bruce Williams again, and I'd like to give you the second part of my lecture on gross pathology of the spleen, in which we'll talk about something that's very common in a number of species, and that's splenic neoplasia. As I generally do at the beginning of each lecture, I want to thank all of my colleagues who have provided me images over the years that allow me to put these little presentations together. An important concept when thinking about splenic neoplasia is that the vast majority of the tumors you see in the spleen are those of normal splenic elements, whether it's the endothelium, lymphocytes, macrophages, or even stromal elements. The spleen is extremely adept at identifying and eliminating metastatic tumors from other organs. But when the tumors arise from components which are native to the spleen, it doesn't do a very good job. We're looking at a case of splenic lymphoma in a dog, and about 57% of cases of lymphoma in the dog have splenic involvement, and about 43% of cases in cats have splenic involvement, which means it just doesn't do a very good job identifying tumors of its native elements. Now, lymphoma in the dog can take a number of different appearances, so don't be fooled. Of course, large, fish flesh or white tumors in any organ makes you want to think about lymphoma. However, many cases in a variety of species of lymphoma will have a diffuse pattern and will result in overall enlargement, the formation of what I've called before the meaty spleen, not the typical nodular involvement that you would expect. Here's a case of lymphoma in the cat that resulted in splenomegaly, but on cut section, we can see not big nodules, not diffuse involvement, but these little tiny nodules of lymphoma. In certain species, like rodents, diffuse enlargement of organs is the rule for lymphoma. Here we see a very enlarged spleen, and the liver is enlarged as well. This could also be histiocytic sarcoma in this mouse, as histiocytes are a normal component of the spleen, and it's probably not going to catch it. But when I see a large liver and a large spleen in mice, I am always going to think about lymphoma first, second, and third. Here is another picture of lymphoma in a mouse, but this one in the spleen takes a more nodular appearance. But look how big that spleen has become. Look how big that liver has become. I'm always going to think about lymphoma. Here's a nude mouse. And we don't think of nude mice as having any lymphocytes, but the vast majority of nude mice are what we call leaky. And they do have lymphocytes, but their somatid immunity is not very good. They have enough lymphocytes that eventually, as they get old, they will form lymphomas. And their immune system is so poor that they can't catch them. So lymphoma actually is a very common finding in older nude mice. Now we're looking at a very diffusely enlarged spleen in a rat. And this is a particular strain of rat called a Fisher 344. And mononuclear cell leukemia, which used to be called large granular cell leukemia, is one of the most common diseases of this particular species. Affected animals show diffuse splenic and liver involvement. It is thought that the cells that cause mononuclear cell leukemia are likely NK cells, and the tumors arise in the spleen. And these animals have massive numbers of circulating neoplastic lymphocytes. It was called large granular cell leukemia for many years because if you stained a peripheral blood smear, you can't see it on histo, but on, on a geme sustained or a diff quick stained peripheral blood smear, the neoplastic cells would have large granules. This is one of the major reasons that we don't see Fisher 344s, which are very nice, friendly rats and easy to handle, used in research much today because they just have this condition too much after a year of age. 
In the horse, we also see splenic lymphoma as a primary lymphoma as well as part of a multicentric lymphoma, which will affect multiple organs. The vast majority of equine lymphomas are T-cell rich B-cell tumors, but occasionally you will see primary diffuse large B-cell tumors. Here's one that was just several large nodules and a second one that, like that cat spleen, upon incision in this beautiful picture from Amy Perry, we see these multiple small nodules. Another nice nodular splenic lymphoma. Horses with splenic lymphoma, even primary splenic lymphoma, often have a regenerative hemolytic anemia because the spleen is activated and takes a lot of blood cells out of circulation. Lymphoma of the spleen of the ox is not uncommon and usually associated with bovine leukosis virus infection. Spleens may get so large and friable that mild trauma may result in rupture and exsanguination. And lymphoma is the number one tumor in the goats, as reported by Dr. Christian Lohr in a paper in VetPath just a few years ago, although splenic involvement is not very common. In poultry, the spleen is often affected by tumors of the lymphoid system or lymphocytes, and there are a number of viruses that will cause this. The herpes virus that causes Marek's disease may result in neoplastic lymphocytes infiltrating multiple organs, and we can see that there is infiltration within the eye of this chicken. The pupil is an abnormal shape, and we see this with Marek's disease. And here are three spleens from three different chickens. The one in the center is normal, and the one on both sides is are greatly enlarged by the infiltration by neoplastic lymphocytes. And you would look at other organs, uh, even nerves and feather follicles, for neoplastic lymphocytes in Barrick's disease. Another virus that commonly results in lymphoma in the spleen of poultry is a retrovirus which causes the disease lymphoid leukosis. This particular virus tends to cause neoplastic infiltration of visceral organs a lot more commonly than does the one in Marek's disease. Other differences include the fact that Marek's disease is generally neoplastic T cells, lymphoid leukosis, generally neoplastic B cells, and a third, much less common virus, the reticuloendothelial virus, can result in lymphoma in multiple organs of either T or B cells. It is very difficult to tell the difference between these three diseases simply on histologic review of slides. Dr. Cindy Bell gave me a tip a number of years ago, which I have found helpful, in that the T lymphocytes associated with Marek's disease tend to look a lot more beaten up and war-weary and uh, apoptotic than the B cells that you'll see with lymphoid leukosis. But if you really want to get to a diagnosis and differentiate between three diseases, you're going to need to pursue PCR or some advanced testing. Well, that's it for lymphoma. Let's look at another very common neoplasm in the spleen of the dog and that's hemangiosarcoma. And we looked at it in our last lecture and how these tumors tend to rupture and they will metastasize to the adjacent mesentery. The spleen is one of the top three sites for development of hemangiosarcoma in the dog, the other two being the liver and the right atrium. But you can find it in any organ, 
either as a result of metastasis, because the endothelial cells will break off, they'll go throughout the body, they're generally recognized as normal, and they set up shop very easily. Hemangiosarcoma can also arise in any organ because every organ has endothelial cells. Now we tend to look at these red raised nodules on the spleen and immediately say hemangiosarcoma. But if you look at this spleen, you can see that the neoplasm on cut section is very white. There's not a lot of hemorrhage. This is still a mangiosarcoma, but it is a very cellular tumor. And there's a lot more cells than the other one. There's not a lot of room for the blood to percolate in between. So don't be fooled. A whitish tumor might be a mangiosarcoma as well. a third neoplasm of the canine spleen, and one that is extremely malignant along the lines of a mangiosarcoma are splenic sarcomas. And these may be a, from a wide range of different mesenchymal elements of the spleen, whether they are fibrocytes, whether they are smooth muscle cells. And the vast majority of these, it's very difficult to get a good read as to what they exactly are. They're highly malignant, and they're associated with a short survival time in the dog. If we look at a couple of other interesting tumors, this is the spleen and the liver of a cat, which is massively enlarged. And you probably saw the capsular folds in the spleen and knew that this was a cat. But look how big and nodular these two organs have gotten. And this is a condition that is known either as visceral mast cell tumor or systemic mastocytosis. And it's occasionally seen in cats. It's usually unassociated with mast cell tumors of the skin in cats, which often pursue a very benign course. But you will occasionally run across this in older cats where you will see a population of neoplastic mast cells about 60% of these cats have CKIP mutations. But the neoplastic mast cells are most often seen in the spleen, the liver, and the intestine, where it can grossly mimic lymphoma. Another neoplasm that's commonly seen in cats, you may see it in exotic animals such as cheetahs or grizzly bears, but you can see it in any species, including man, are myelolipomas. This cat has multiple myelolipomas. You can see them uh, singly. You can see them uh, with multiple forms, as we see here. And if you look at them histologically, these benign neoplasms, generally about half fat, half myeloid and erythroid precursors. Our last image on this quick review of splenic neoplasia is a very large, diffusely uh, engorged spleen of a cat with a neoplasm of the erythrocytes, known as erythremic myelosis or erythroleukemia. And occasionally, the spleen is a part of the distribution of these odd neoplasms of the hematopoietic system, which may uh, be myeloid in nature, may be erythroid in nature. One of my favorites is seen in rats. It is a leukemia of eosinophils, and you know when you get a lot of eosinophils together, they have a greenish color to them. Think about eosinophilic myositis in cattle. And uh, these rats have green spleens, green lymph nodes, and green bone marrow. That's known as chloroleukemia. Well, I think we've covered splenic neoplasia fairly well. I hope you enjoyed this little lecture. And in the third part of the lecture, we will cover some infectious diseases that may affect the spleen in domestic animals. Thanks for your time and attention. Have a great day.